I'm good to go? Better do it before it disappears. Gotcha. <laughs> when I change screens, will it work? No, no promises. <laughs> All right, one other question. Who's heard of Ford becoming a smart mobility company? Oh, a lot of people. CES, 2015, Mark Fields keynote, things like that, or just in the press, reading things in the press? Good. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So I'm that guy. Tom Bryan's delivery manager for Ford Motor Company's Connected Vehicle Data Platform. Joining me is Dan Totten. He's with our Enterprise Architecture Group. And Joe Nemec, who is our resident Hortonworks architect. Nice to have him on board. So I'll give you an overview of our Connected Vehicle strategy. And we should have some time for Q&A at the end. And hopefully when I switch slides, this works. Nice. So Ford's undergoing a transition. We're going from a car company where revenue is generated from vehicle sales, parts, accessories, and service to a mobility company. Okay. You can see our infinity symbol in the middle showing core business on the left, emerging opportunities on the right. One of those opportunities is mobility. What is a mobility company? A mobility company helps to change the way the world moves. That's what Ford's trying to become. Mobility is about human progress. It's about getting food to stores, in urban areas especially. It's about getting ambulances to emergencies in a timely fashion. It's about getting people to work and getting people home. At the center of that transformation is the connected vehicle. Now, there's four um, megatrends that Ford's looking at as far as smart mobility goes. The first one is urbanization, which is the growing population in urban environments. And here, the infrastructure simply can't keep up with the amount of uh, cars on the road. The second is global middle class growth. Global middle class growth, especially in, uh, in Asia, is expected to double from 2 billion to 4 billion by the year 2030. Part of the middle class dream is owning a car. The third is air quality. Um, we're very concerned about urban air quality uh, and air pollution and its health effects. And the fourth is changing consumer attitudes. Millennials do things different. Probably a lot of millennials in here, but you guys are good with things like car sharing instead of owning a car. You're good with ride sharing. You're good with, uh, with mass transit and things like that. So Ford's developed a blueprint for mobility. That blueprint includes things such as vehicles that talk to one another, as well as the infrastructure, people that want to share vehicles, and enabling that sharing of vehicles. Mobility versus gridlock, especially in urban areas. Right on cue. Finding things like finding parking spaces, or if you're coming into a congested urban area, getting that parking space and finding that last mile or two commute. So it could be a ride share, it could be mass transit, it could be a bicycle, it could be multiple things. And everyone's aware of autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars. I think all auto OEMs are working on those. Um, so those are definitely in the future. So this blueprint may mean less vehicles sold in the future but more usage on those vehicles. If you're car sharing a vehicle, they'll get used more often instead of sitting idle in the parking lot while you're at work. Okay, so Ford is definitely embracing the smart mobility culture and we're trying to do a transformation to smart mobility. You guys got anything to add to that? With the uh, infinity symbol you see there, uh, this is the, the part where it's not two different organizations. It's really trying to bridge uh, those two together. So the core and the emerging are linked together. 
It's not the idea of one versus the other. They're, they're, the ecosystem is there. We do have organization um, on the right-hand side specifically to support that and really uh, sort of in an agile framework to try and speed up the delivery that we have within that emerging space. So. Thanks, Dan. Gotcha. So, what is a connected vehicle? A connected vehicle has the means to transmit data. A connected vehicle has the means to receive data. Okay? By receive data, think things like over-the-air software updates. Okay? If you have a problem, a lot of uh, problems in the vehicle are software problems now. It sure would be nice to download an over there software update instead of scheduling an appointment with your dealer, taking it into the dealer, and getting a software update that way. How do we collect data from our connected vehicles? Three basic ways. The first is data over voice. We've been using this method for 10 plus years. And basically, we use the consumer's cell phone to transmit a very small payload over cellular voice connection. Uh, next we have, let's see here. Next we have built-in embedded modems. The embedded modems uh, use 4G cellular data to transmit a more robust payload than the data over voice payload. And then we have the plug-in devices. So the plug-in devices plug into the vehicle's diagnostic port and they transmit over LTE network. And they're a very, very strong payload, or robust payload, or frequent payload. So with some of our plug-in devices, we can pretty much breadcrumb the vehicles. Where does data go from the vehicle? As the data leaves the vehicle, it goes to various cloud partners. So the DOV goes to a partner called Airbiquity. The embedded modem data goes to partners Accenture, Telagis, and Ford Clouds. So you can see vehicle data, depending on the device, goes to many different clouds. And the plug-in device data goes to Delphi, Azure Cloud, or the Ford Cloud. The Ford Cloud happens to be on Azure, by the way, if you're asking. So. From the cloud, where does the data go? The data securely travels via various protocols, including HTTPS, secure FTP, and streaming over AMQPS. So the different cloud providers have different mechanisms of transmitting the data to us. And one other challenge is Every cloud provider usually has a different format of the data. So when we, when we receive the data, we have to transform it. We're using different business rules. The data is then stored in our uh, Ford Enterprise Hadoop platform, where we land it and transform it using various Hadoop components, such as Storm, MapReduce, Uzi, Pig, and Java. And then we finally store the data in Hive and HBase. Joe, you got anything there? So it's probably also worth kind of noting from an architectural perspective that when you know dealing with networking and security teams, it's typically a lot easier if you can architect this data collection so that it's a pull, right? The origin is the data center reaching out to the cloud and bringing it back down into the, the data center landing and on HDFS. Uh, if you decide to go the opposite route where people are going to try to push to you, um, you know, your, your security teams, for one, probably won't want to punch the firewall holes open for specific payloads, and you'll be forced to effectively run a, a public endpoint at your data center, potentially, right? And that's kind of insecure, right, in today's world. If we're going to have a public data point somewhere, we should have it in the cloud where it's already public, right, and keep the edge devices and keep the data center isolated from being contacted by anything from the public side.
Next thing we're going to look at is what kind of data is collected from the vehicle. So data we collect from the vehicle includes CAN signals and messages. These are things like the odometer, the engine RPM, the location from the GPS module. Temperature is both uh, ambient temperature and uh, internal temperature, um, all kinds of other information. Uh, there's about 100 ECUs on a vehicle, and all these are doing their jobs from a tire pressure monitoring sensor to a restraint control module to an instrument cluster module, and they all have values. So we can get all those values and bring those back um, in, from the CAN signals and messages. The next thing we receive is diagnostic trouble codes. So these are DTCs. These include things like cylinder misfires or emissions faults. These usually trigger your service engine soon light and make you make a dealership appointment or you go to AutoZone and have them plug in the diagnostics tool and figure out what's going on. But you really need a diagnostics tool to figure out what that code means. So those come back. And the third is warning indicator lamp status. So you think of a warning indicator lamp as anything that comes on your dashboard. It includes things like your service engine soon, low fuel, low tire pressure, um, things like that. The, uh, the DTC codes, the diagnostic trouble codes, is always a fun one because the vehicles don't necessarily produce these all the time, right? And it's a good thought exercise to wrap around thinking about what is implied by not having the DTC codes, right? So often we're focused only on what we're actually able to collect and we forget that what we didn't collect or what wasn't available to us is potentially 50, 100,000 times larger, right? Because all of those messages are not coming off the vehicle. So what does it imply that you didn't collect and how valuable is that actually? Yeah. One thing gathering the DTC is too, we can also, if there is a potential systemic issue, we can do corrective actions a lot quicker. Um, previously, we'd have to wait for you to make an appointment with the dealer, go into the dealer, dealer runs diagnostics, right? Submit a warranty claim, that warranty claim comes back and we analyze it. Now as soon as the DTC comes, the connected vehicle sends it up to Ford, we can analyze it and we can look at corrective actions. So uh, um, it, it does save time with that as well. So, I'll open this up. I think some of you guys w were uh, in some sessions yesterday where this came. How, mu how, much vehicle can a gen uh, how much data can a vehicle generate? Any ideas? Gigabit. Gigabit a day? A day? That's, that's pretty good. What's that? <laughs> you were in the session yesterday. You heard that from Simon, I'm sure. So I don't know if Simon's in the audience, but yeah. So. A single vehicle can generate up to 25 gig of control area network an hour. I think this is our um, battery electric fusion that does that. It's got a lot of uh, ECUs in there and it generates a lot of CAN traffic. Now we're not bringing all this data back up to the cloud and bringing it into our back end, right? A lot of this is computer to computer traffic on the CAN bus. Um, a standard vehicle can have anywhere from 75 to 150 dedicated ECUs and they talk to each other on the traffic, on, on, the, on the network. So they generate a lot of traffic and there's a lot of chatter. Um, we, of course, aren't bringing all this back. What we are bringing back is information on key on, key off, key on plus one, and any type of events um, that generate a data transmittal packet. So if your warning indicator lamp comes on or a DTC fires, that'll generate a payload to come back. Um, what does our payload look like? So this is an example of our 4G payload. So it's unreadable, right? But in there's all that good stuff like odometer and location and temperature. It's basically, when we get it, it's encrypted. It's base 64 encoded. It's just a blob of data with a specification where we need to do the transformation um, of the data and able to store it properly. What I'm going to do now is go through a couple simple use cases. So everyone's familiar with remote start with their key fab. 
Some of you are familiar with the Ford Pass app. So if you're not in direct line, I might be sitting in this conference room. It might be really hot or really cold outside. So I want to perform a remote start on my vehicle. So I've got my vehicle. We've got the Ford Cloud. We've got the Enterprise Hadoop data platform. And I've got my cool Ford Pass app. So I take my cell phone, open that up, say I want to remote start my vehicle. And when you do that, it sends a request up to the Ford Cloud, which then sends that request down to the vehicle. And it also sends data back to the enterprise data platform, basically saying that, hey, a remote start command was received from the vehicle, or received from the mobile app, and a re remote start command was sent down to the vehicle. Okay. Upon the, the vehicle successfully starting, it sends the confirmation up to the cloud. The cloud sends that data back to the enterprise data platform where we log the remote start confirmation received from vehicle and re remote start confirmation was um, sent to the mobile device. That comes down to the mobile device. You look at your mobile device, it turns green or something, your engine's running, so you know your remote start was successful. Uh, the big reason we go to the back end on this is a couple. Number one, we can track feature usage. So is remote start from the Ford Pass app valuable, or are people still using their key fob for it? Um, your key fob's got a range limitation where the, the mobile app doesn't. And we can also look at success of our uh, feature usage, right? So I sent a remote start request. Did it succeed, right? So we're logging that so we can look at feature usage man, and robustness of the feature. The next use case is our Ford Credit variable lease use case. So, you got a Mustang? Got a Mustang. All right. So there's Dan's Mustang. It's connected to the cloud, which is connected to our enterprise data platform. And Dan goes to Ford Credit and he gets a nice term, a $350 a month base for 24 months with 24,000 miles. Everyone's familiar with lease terms, right? So. Dan likes to ride share or use mass transit to get to work. So he only uses his Mustang on the weekend. And that 24,000 miles, he probably won't use in those two years. So as you know, the vehicle transmits information up to the Ford Cloud, which then sends information like odometer to the enterprise data platform. What if Ford Credit could pull that odometer information and offer Dan a variable lease where he's paying $250 a month base for that 24 months, and then a variable rate depending on how many miles he drove that month. Okay, so those are some of the things we're looking at using the information to do, and we're actually doing this variable lease in pilot mode right now. Okay, now I'm gonna get into the fun stuff. Ready, Joe? Everyone see that? So this is a real simplified version of the architecture patterns we use. As we discussed earlier, we can receive data from Azure Event Hubs, Secure FTP, RESTful Web Services, and I didn't mention it earlier, but we also pull data from internal databases. Okay. We use Uzi to schedule our workflows, as I'm sure everyone does, and ingest the data using Storm Spouts, Java applications, Java web services, and for the internal databases, we most of the time use Scoop. The raw data from those things brought directly into HDFS, that's where we land it, where we transform it using Java, MapReduce, or PIG. And then we utilize uh, dedupe logic, data classification, Hive partitioning, and data validation, and load it into Hive and HBase tables. For security, we control access uh, to the data with the help of Ranger. And we are looking at some other things. What's, what are we looking at? Subscription stuff. 
Yeah, for security. So, so that we're also evaluating a number of uh, third-party encryption vendors uh, so that we can perform column-level encryption, row-level encryptions, and cell encryptions in Hive tables today um, so that we are able to fill the encryption gap, so to speak, um, where currently Ranger only provides block-level encryption at HDFS. You have any more on this slide, Joe? Yeah, are you good? No, we can we can talk for a minute here. So there are some uh, interesting things that we found uh, when going through and kind of coming out with these patterns. You know, the ORC files in particular um, was part of a, a very interesting discovery in that because the connected vehicle data is so repetitive in nature, right, it compresses really well, and then it compresses fantastic if you can put it into a columnar format, right? So we were able to watch. Um, our JSON data. Sets. 20 to 1. Yeah. yeah, 20 to 1 compression ratio, right? Um, and then additionally, we had a number of queries that uh, wouldn't finish, and then some would, but they would take a significant period of time that now finish quickly or actually finish uh, once we moved over to ORC files. Um, from the HBase perspective, uh, you can imagine HBase utilization as if you wanted a kind of master view of a vehicle at any given time, right? So what is the absolute latest known information that we can populate um, from that given vehicle and then power web services that are able to make RESTful calls to HBase to power other downstream applications without us actually having to understand how they want to reconsume that latest vehicle record. Are we imposing a schema on it? No, actually it comes in from each cloud app in a different format. So we look at the specification from each source. So we have plug-in devices from Delphi, from OpenXC, um, and from other vendors with all different specifications. And then um, our embedded modems come with a different specification. Whether they're 3G or 4G data, it's a different specification. Um, as we add features, the specification will change. So no, it's never, we don't impose a specification at all. One of our actually challenges is that we have multiple specifications that we have to do that transformation on. The data classifications? Yeah, how do you classify the data when you're trying to load it into the Hive table? Yeah, so we have a, we have a data operations team okay. um, within GDIA, our Global Data Insight and Analytics Group, and what they do is they look at the data and they'll, they classify it. Um, they work with our, our OGC group to make sure that the classification is done. It's classified as um, public, PII, or secret and uh, we control access to it um, depending on the classification. Is that what you were getting at? Yeah. Okay. Isn't the uh, data uh, discoverable? Excuse me? Is it discoverable? The data is absolutely discoverable, but by whom? So access is controlled to who can discover the data? Um, yes, it is. So yeah, from a, from a legal point, it is discoverable. We haven't had to do that yet, but it is. Are you connecting any uh, vehicle geolocation information? Uh, yeah, so GPS is a module on there, so we are collecting uh, GPS information. We are required. Question is, it's a big security question for you. Sure. Right. Personal data issues. Yep. So we have uh, our OGTC team and our lawyers are definitely all over that, and they help us classify the data. Um, we don't breadcrumb everything. Most vehicles, we don't breadcrumb. The only thing that's really breadcrumbed right now is people with plug-in devices and our fleet telematic stuff. So if you own a fleet of vehicles, you could install uh, embedded modems to track your fleet, right, and you own that vehicle. Um, as far as consumers go, it's strictly on opt-in. Uh, there are countries where GPS gets scrubbed before it leaves the country. So China, for example, GPS does not leave the country and does not come back in. 
Um, in Europe, we have challenges, and I was going to get to those challenges before, but there are things like the right to be forgotten. Um, where if, if someone says, I, I opted in and allowed you to collect my data, but now I don't want you to have it anymore, get rid of it, right? We have to take into account th things like that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking, one of our challenges is country by country specific regulation. So um, believe me, we're, we're following all the, there's auto alliance principles, privacy principles, that all auto companies doing connected vehicle are following. And we definitely don't collect uh, data unless the customer opts in and allows us to, to collect it. Does data go to any third parties or is it kept entirely? Um, as of right now, no data is going to third parties. It's a good question, though. We do purchase data from third parties. I just wanted to take a second here and elaborate on the deduplication logic. Right? because I think that's something that people are going to very easily overlook the value of understanding how to dedupe your ingest against potentially petabytes of data that you've been storing over the long term, right? You don't wanna do a full table join against your ingest just to find out um, that I've only got one additional duplicate record. Uh, there were numerous kind of designs that got floated around for this. One of them utilized HBase. You know, we found out eventually just to have a 90-day window, we were going to need to have 60 dedicated HBase servers to deduplicate just 90 days, right? And that was unacceptable. What we found um, was Tez actually has a feature called dynamic partition pruning, okay? This dynamic partition pruning, um, unlike when you're using Hive on MapReduce where you have to specify the partition that you're joining on up front, allows us to use a temporary table that we can insert all of the partitions, and we partition by day, right, the day that the data was generated, right? So now we're able to come up with a list of just the partitions for which we've received events for, which is usually a very small number of days. We might get one laggard event that comes in a little bit late, and now we can join specifically against just the partitions for which we're ingesting against, and do basically a left outer join test for null, and be able to put non-duplicate records in and duplicate, dedupe against all time and against all the data that we've managed to store. I'm sorry, can you speak up? Outside of cell range? Did you say outside of cell, cellular range? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I believe, the, I, don't think, I don't think it caches the data on the vehicle. I think it might just drop it, but I'm not 100% sure. It depends on the PID device. So some of the plug-in devices have uh, miniature databases inside them where we're able to aggregate the data until we have the ability to transfer it again. So it really greatly depends on what piece of hardware in exactly what make, model, year of car. So this is a very bad story in the software sector. The first one that you talked about, the generation of these software models, the software that they're first in, real-time or quasi-real-time events, like they just get the call or Yeah, this is really how we ingest data back from the cloud into our enterprise data platform. Um, the cloud to support the features, like the remote start feature, or find my vehicle feature, it actually cracks open the payload in the cloud and stores that payload. So on a key off, it'll store your vehicle's location for a period of time. That location also come back and get ingested through this, but this is the back end and it's kind of taken out of the picture to support the features. The features would go, vehicle, cloud, mobile app, and stay in there. Um, all the information would come back to the back end for analytics being done later, but the real-time features are supported in the cloud. And, and we actually have another initiative that we're building out real-time streaming analytics to be able to support uh, future use cases from that standpoint, so.
Dan, go ahead. <laughs> That's right, you don't see that, but we have a number of initiatives around machine learning and deep learning that we're, we're probably not gonna present right now, so. Yeah, we are at the um, beginning of this journey. So I think a lot of companies and a lot of people in this room that I've heard of are at the beginning of a similar journey. So we have a lot of plans to extend this, right? This is more of a, here's where we're at right now, right? And Dan is our enterprise architect and he's, he's looking at things like machine learning. The, the other way to look at this is how do you design projects that are consumable chunks, right? Um, so real-time streaming in the cloud is effectively one chunk and it lets you focus just solely on real-time streaming problems, right, with a separate team. Then you have a storage platform and processing that makes all the data ready for analytics later. And then you have multiple analytics projects that can reuse the same data, right? It's, it's in essence literally part of why you're building the data lake, right? It's not saying that I had one project to just do some analytics on the car, it's saying that I need to store all the data because I have many analytic projects. Yeah, so we'll get to what our production cluster looks like and we have a DR cluster that's, that's the same. So um, in two data centers, we have a pr production cluster and a DR cluster. We won't necessarily get to that. Um, but as far as the data loads, we have that information. It's not part of that presentation, but it's ramping up. It's hockey stick. And we're, we're just now deploying 2017 escapes with 4G, data mod 4G modems. Those are going in the F-150s and the Fusions this year. So we expect connected vehicle data to really increase this year. Any reason you're not using AWS or Google Cloud? Uh, yeah, but we won't talk about that right now. I mean, we're using Azure. <laughs> That's, that's why. How long did it take you to build up? We've been working on this about 18 months. Yeah, since we've got our first Hadoop platform. You know, our, our, our first cluster was 10 nodes, and now we have about 260 nodes on our cluster. So about, about 18 months, Joe? Dan? Yeah. All right. Yes. Ernie, what's that? Or, or Joe, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, currently, uh, data is replicated nightly to the DR cluster because we have the throughput to be able to, to perform that action. Yeah. Let me get through a couple more slides because we got about three minutes left. And hopefully we'll have some questions at the end, <laughs> some time for questions at the end. So uh, some of these we covered. These are challenges and opportunity. So country-specific regulations, GPS can't leave uh, a certain countries in the EU right to be forgotten. Um, we covered that one. You guys ask good questions. The next one's data privacy. We asked about that. So Ford follows the, uh, the auto alliance principles and customers must explicitly opt in and they can, they can opt out. Um, the next one is integration with the multiple cloud partners and suppliers, so getting test data is difficult, having different interfaces with each of them is very difficult, having a different format come down from each of them and different transformation logic is very difficult. Uh, the next one is um, storage and updates, so, so doing um, Hive updates, I don't think you can do them, right? Um, we, we have a pattern where we're basically using, we're putting all the vehicle data in Hive and then we're storing the reference data in HBase is basically the pattern, pattern we do. So in place Hive updates, can't do them yet, yet, right? I think that's uh, GA and an upcoming release here for okay. Hive Acid update capability. All right. The, the next one is standards and frameworks. So we've created a connected vehicle data platform common framework, and that previous architecture slide is very high level on, on what we go through for that common uh, framework. We use Storm to land the streaming data off an Azure Event Hub. Um, we use Knox to land data from a Java web, web service through WebSphere. And then the last one, I'm sure everyone's interest is in is security. So 
data must be encrypted at all times. It's at rest, in transit, or in motion, right? So data is always encrypted. And then um, we also perform country level partitioning on our hive tables. That way it's easy to apply country specific rules that we have. Um, let me see what we got next. I'm fighting the clock here, guys. So a little bit about our um, Hadoop cluster. Less than a year ago, not even that probably, we had a 10 node cluster. Today, thanks to our operations guys, we have, uh, 260, we have 261 data nodes, 5,200 CPU cores, 65 terabytes of RAM, five petabytes of usable storage, and 10 racks consuming 130 kilowatts of power. And we are definitely expecting to grow this out as we transform into a mobility company. Um, good question. I, I don't know exactly, um, but I will follow up. Do you know what? It, do you remember what it is, Joe? Dan or Ernie, are you guys going to answer or not? This is also not sure uh, either. <laughs> yeah, it, it grows every day. So um, we. I, I don't think it's the number that Ford should change. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, I don't. I don't know what it is today. We have some operational reports. We were looking at them, and of course, our oper We have a couple operations guys in here. They would probably know better than me. I know what connected vehicle data is in, is in there, but there's a lot more uh, data in our Hadoop cluster than just connected data. So, any more questions? We got eight seconds. <laughs> Yeah, so how does the value charging solution work? So we collect information from all the utility companies on when their rates are low, right? And the full, in your mobile app, what you can do is say, I want a value charge, and rates are peak between 2 and 6 p.m. because everyone's running air conditioning, and they're off peak at midnight to 4 a.m. So if you set up value charging, you'll go home at 6 p.m., you'll plug it in at peak rate, but it won't start charging until off peak rate. So that's how that works. Sim I mean, that was a three-second answer. But hopefully you got that. Yeah. Yeah, they're what, HP what? HP Apollo 4000s, I believe. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's one of HP's reference architectures for uh, um, the big data reference architecture that they have. Well, thank you all for coming. Hopefully you guys learned something. <laughs>